verses uh, 12 through uh, 18, 25, 35, but we're only going to start on a small section right now, 12 through 25. Uh, We're going to read verses 12 through 16 right now. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, and prepare, prepare for us there. And the disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You all may be seated. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word, your word written and preserved for us. And we're so grateful for this privilege to come before your holy word, to hear and respond and to live our lives as believers of the truth. We pray all this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, like I said, this morning we're going to be looking at uh, verses 12 through 25, uh, but there's three distinct subsections in this passage, and so I want to frame our conversation this morning around those. And the first one comes in these verses 12 through 16. If you remember last time we looked at, uh, or excuse me, two weeks ago, we looked at covenant theology. We talked about what does it mean that we as Presbyterians, you're not Presbyterian here, bear with me, but for, for us here at Alta Vista Presbyterian Church, we are covenantalists. That's our system of theology. What does that mean? Why are we that way? We unpacked that a little bit a couple weeks ago, and I just want to recap a little about what we talked about within the subject of the Passover, because that's where we are in Jesus's life. Uh, Jesus is on the the last uh, week of his life, actually the last few days of his life. Uh, This is the Thursday morning, if you will, of Jesus's uh, final day of earthly ministry. Like I said, we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark for the rest of this year, so we're going to be just living in this Holy Week for, uh, for the next few months. And so in the Passover, remember we talked about what the Passover was, what it represents, what happened in that moment back in Egypt. And if you remember your stories, if you weren't here that Sunday, of course we all know the, the, the story, the general story of the Passover, uh, how uh, God had uh, a promise and sent ten, uh, nine plagues to, to Egypt and, and still Pharaoh refused to, to let the Hebrew slaves free and finally uh, uh, God uh, says to Moses, I'm going to send the tenth and final plague and after this plague uh, he will set you all free. But this is an important plague. This is a plague that will, could affect even the Hebrews. If you remember reading the other ones, uh, the Hebrews were never affected by the other nine uh, plagues. For instance, the darkness that overtook all of, of Egypt. All the Egyptians lived in that darkness during that time. And yet, it was the Hebrews whose candles still flickered. But in this case, on the final, uh, final uh, plague, even the Hebrews could experience that plague. Now, of course, this plague in covenant theology, as we've discussed, represents God's judgment. God's wrath poured out upon the whole country in Egypt. And that everyone, man and beast, would experience the death of the firstborn son unless that house was covered by the lamb that was slain. Now, of course, we know that that was a precursor to Jesus Christ. And that God's promise of redemption was established in eternity past. That God didn't suddenly come up when Jesus was born uh, and and enter in this world and decide suddenly, oh, you know, I want to find a way to save my people. Now, that plan of redemption has always existed. 
That plan has always been in God's mind. There is no plan B for God. There is plan A. It is his plan of redemption, and that plan has always and will continue to be at play. And so that plan of redemption is redemption from, is salvation from God's own wrath. Because as Paul tells us, God looks at iniquity and his wrath burns hot against it. We just look at the Old Testament, we see that God abhors wickedness. And yet the only way for things not to be consumed are for them to be covered by the blood of a mediator. And so we see that Jesus is the ultimate slain lamb, that ultimate mediator. In Passover, that the, the physical lamb, that, that lamb that they sacrificed, represented and pointed to Christ. In Christ, all of us who are covered by his blood are protected and redeemed from the judgment of God. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, the Sunday school class heard this already, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we are covered by the blood of Christ, we are not condemned as guilty before God's judgment seat. That is at a heart of covenant theology. We talked about what that looks like, how it, how it plays out in covenant. We're not going to unpack that today because we don't have much time. I want to move on to the next following verses, verses 17 through 21. This is really what I want us to focus on this morning, how the covenant promise is made known. I do want to say briefly, just in verses 12 through 16, we get a glimpse of Jesus's divine nature coming forth. You know, he, he tells, and of course we saw this when uh, he entered Jerusalem and told his disciples, there's going to, that you're, you're going to find a cult and bring her to me. And if someone asks you, what are you doing? Tell them the Lord has need of it. And of course the disciples know, hopefully by now they know, as we'll see, not all of them know. But hopefully by now they know that Jesus has a divine nature who is able to communicate to his human nature certain things. And so we see that here again. He, he predicts, if you will, that this room is going to be prepared and that you need to go down there, disciples, and set it up. Or don't even have to set it up. Just go tell them that I'm coming. Just a little glimpse into God's uh, to the divine nature communicating to the human nature. But again, I want to focus on verse 17 through 21 right now. Let me read those to you. And when it was evening, he came with the 12. So they found the room all day. They did things. Mark wants us to focus in on the evening. When it was evening, he came with the 12. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. And one who is eating with me? They began to be grieved and to say to him, one by one, surely not I. And he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Some strong words in that sentence. We'll have to unpack that in a moment. Je the, Jesus here is speaking about the, the prediction of this covenant promise that's going to come to pass. I'm going to jump back to Psalm 41 momentarily and just read to you from this passage. Here in Psalm 41, the psalmist is giving us a glimpse into the prophecies of the Messiah. And in verse 9, he says, Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Now, of course, this is David proclaiming, and in David's life, he experienced much betrayal. Betrayal by his own son, betrayal by his generals, betrayal even by his own king, Saul. But, of course, this is not just talking about David. This is talking about the one who is to come as David's heir. And so even his close friend, in whom he trusted, who ate his bread, has lifted up his heel against him. 
And of course, we just have to turn to Isaiah chapter 53, the great messianic prophecy. Many great verses in there, but I just want to look at verses 6 and 7 in Isaiah 53. Here the prophet says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Jesus just predicted that all 12 of his disciples will turn. All have turned like sheep and gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Our iniquity, our sinfulness fell on Jesus' shoulders. Each of us turned from Jesus. Each of us was like Judas who dipped in that bowl and betrayed Christ. And yet even our betrayal is carried on his shoulders. Verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Now, of course, that's important because much later when we get to that section, Jesus will eventually stop saying things and he will go silently like a lamb to the slaughter. But he knew. It was predicted of in the Old Testament. He knew what his mission was. And next week, we'll unpack how the human nature wrestled with that. But for now, I just want to point out that this has always been God's plan. God just didn't suddenly come up with the plan when Jesus was born. This has always been plan A. And so in this moment, there is this deep betrayal. They were reclining at table. They, they were eating together. When we gather together as, as family and, and friends, uh, maybe at, at Christmas or, or Thanksgiving, that's one of our big ones, Easter, all of our big holidays, when we gather with family, we want to hang out, we want to we just be together. We usually set up rules. Oh, don't talk about religion and politics. We don't, want, we don't want to offend anyone. Because we know that in this moment of, of coming together, there's, there's peace. There's almost vulnerability. Because we can't really leave the table if, you know, cousin whomever starts talking about politics or, or uncle whoever starts talking about uh, Jesus. It's rude to just leave, and so you've got to sit there and listen to that. There's some, there seems to be a, a sanctity of the table. That was true in Jesus' day. Here the twelve are gathered around with him in this sacred space. And of course we'll see how sacred it becomes when we unpack the Lord's Supper. But even just thinking in a physical sense, this moment of, of these guys coming together to celebrate the Passover as a family. And in that moment, Jesus predicts and knows that there will be betrayal. How deep do you think that, that pierced him in his soul? If you knew whenever you gathered together on your Thanksgiving dinner that, that aunt whomever was going to, to turn on you, betray you in some way, betray your confidences in her, if you told her some secret and suddenly she blurts it out, you be like, well, why did I invite you? <clears throat> Multiply that to this level of betrayal. This is a personal turning against Jesus. And, and so much that all the others even say it's unthinkable. Oh, Jesus, we wouldn't do that. One at a time, Mark tells us. They said, surely not I. Oh, I'm not going to do that, Jesus. I would never do that. Why would we turn on you? Even Judas, everyone is included in here. That bold-faced liar. Oh, I wouldn't do that to you, Jesus. All of them said that was unthinkable. 
It seems all of them forgot about Isaiah chapter 53, where all turn from him. Now, this is the challenging part in verse 21. It says it is one of the 12 in verse 20, the one who dips with me. For the Son of Man, in verse 21, is to go just as it is written of him. Jesus, fully aware of that foreordained plan that was to come to fruition, that needed to come to fruition, because the plan of redemption involved his sacrifice on the cross. He knew that this plan was always established. Even so, Jesus himself says, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. All right, we need to somehow reconcile that, don't we? If God has foreordained this plan, and this is always a question that people ask Presbyterians and other Reformed Christians, if God, you know, we love the doctrine of predestination, at least I do. I love it. I live by it. If, if God has predestined such things to happen, and we'll just use Jesus' example here, but of course we can always use examples in our own life. Why did God allow cancer? Why did God allow death? Why did God allow, allow, allow? I don't have the answers to those specific questions. Because I don't know the mind of God. But as Paul says in Romans 8.28, all things work for good for those who love the Lord. He's not saying all things are good, but all things will eventually work out for our good if we are in Christ Jesus. So I can't answer specifically those, but thankfully God has given us a glimpse into his mind here. We know that God sent Christ, foreordained his son, the second person of the Trinity, to come and die on the cross for our sins. And yet, and yet how is it that this Judas, who betrays Jesus, who, who, who allows this to happen, this good thing to come about, the salvation of our sins, how is Judas punished why does jesus say woe is him it would have been better for judas not to have been born and yet if judas was never born he would not have betrayed jesus to die on the cross for our sins so what do we do with that well one that tells me that our actions matter god has a plan and that plan will come to fruition and god will bring that plan to fruition by human means. In our Westminster Confession of Faith, we believe that uh, God has the ability to do whatever he wants. And of course, we all know that. God has, in, in history, done things at a snap of a finger, created things, done something miraculous, something counter to our understanding. But if you notice, those things are few and far between. By and large, God uses human means. How does God bring judgment on his people Israel? Well, by the, uh, the empiric desires of Nebuchadnezzar, who wanted to expand his lands as king of Babylon. How does uh, uh, God uh, put forth Joseph into Egypt so that he can save his family as a precursor, a prefigure of Christ. How does he do that? Through the treacherous means of his brothers who sell him into slavery. And Joseph, in that, when he finally is re reconciled to his brothers, what does he say at the end of Genesis chapter 38, I believe? He says, you meant it for evil. What you did to me, selling me into slavery, throwing me in that pit, you, my brothers, meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Their actions had consequences. Judas's actions have consequences. 
I want to jump to a book that we Presbyterians don't always uh, talk about, Jude. How many of you know where the book of Jude is? It's right before Revelation. It's not that far. <laughs> it's only one chapter, Jude verse 11. Here Jude says, woe to them. Well, who are the them? Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Who is, who is it they here? Well, this is the ungodly, those who turn from Christ. Jude is, is talking about how there's this history of ungodliness, but also how even within the church, apostasy can lead to ungodliness. And here Jude says, woe to them. And he gives three examples. I just want to briefly skim through them. He says, they've gone the way of Cain. You remember Cain, right? Cain and Abel. What did Cain do? He went by the way of fratricide. He killed his brother. Why did he kill Abel? Because he was jealous. He was angry that God was pleased by Abel's sacrifice. And so he killed his brother. The error of Balaam. How many of you all know the story of Balaam? In the old King James, you ever heard of Balaam's ass? He's on that donkey. It's the only time I get to say that word in church. He's on a donkey. Balaam, in his depravity, was hired by the, the, the king of the Amorites, I believe it was, to come and curse the Israelites. And so he's riding along on his donkey, and this donkey stops constantly because the angel of the Lord is before him, but Balaam can't see the angel. The donkey does. He starts beating that donkey. Why won't you give Eventually, God allows a donkey to speak and says, hey, I can't move. There's an angel in front of me. One of those moments where God, you know, breaks in. And, of course, he sees the angel, and there's a whole bunch. Of, it's a good story. But what the error of Balaam is that in his depravity, he had this moral corruption for greed. He still accepted the payment from the, the other king to go and prophesy against Israel. And if you read the story, he, he can't because God has blessed Israel. The rebellion of Korah. Who was Korah? Uh, in the Old Testament, Korah was one of, uh, of a, a priest of a different, uh, a different group, a different tribe. And Korah wanted to rebel against the Levites. Uh, he was a descendant of Reuben, I believe, Korah was. And he said, well, the firstborn uh, tribe should be uh, the priests because in his mind it was such a prestigious office. But yet God is the one who ordained the Levites to that office. And so Korah incited a, a, an insurgency, a rebellion. Why? Because he coveted the position of priest. And so Jude says, the ungodly have followed the way of Cain. They're angry in their jealousy. The error of Balaam, their corruption for greed, and the rebellion of Korah, who revolt for coveting sake. Judas, even though he was playing his part in the plan of redemption, is still culpable for his ungodliness. And if you think Judas was held responsible, you better believe each and every one of us will be as well. We are going to have to give account to God before his holy throne. Now, as we'll talk about a little bit later, Judas was never covered by the blood of Christ, and so he was the son of perdition from the very beginning. That's the difference between he and I, or he and us. But we, covered in the blood of Christ, though we have no condemnation before God's judgment seat, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that each and every one of us will have to give an account before God. I know I've mentioned this before, and it's always good to remember it. That account isn't condemnation in the sense that we did something bad and now we're going to go to hell even though we're Christians. That's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying to those who are covered by the blood of Christ is that you will have to stand before God's throne. And I use the modern example of a giant screen and our life is going to be flashed before it. I went to... Uh, Steve Jester's retirement last night, little, little party. They had a beautiful video 
accolades lifted up how great a man he was. Indeed, he is a good man, a great servant to this community. Think of something like that. Except instead of accolades, it's going to be our adversary flashing our life and saying, look, there you are not helping that poor person. There you are blaspheming Jesus' name. There you are. There you are. And we're going to stand before God's throne and be like, yeah, I didn't do that. Or I did that, and I didn't seek forgiveness. And we will have to give an account for it. Why? Because God has purchased our life. We talked about that when we talked about covenant. We are purchased by the blood of Christ. Before, as Paul says, we were slaves of unrighteousness. Now we are slaves of righteousness. We belong to God. We, are, we are belong to a different master. And that master is going to ask us to give account for the life that he redeemed. Are you living life to your fullest in the name of Christ? Or are you living life to the fullest for your own pleasures, for your own desires, for your own passions? God's going to ask, and we're going to have to answer Judas here is used by God, but he is not unexcused by God. In this way, as Paul says in Romans chapter 3, God is both the just and the justifier. He is the justifier in that he, has, he, he gives to us this way of redemption through Christ's sacrifice, his betrayal, and his blood. But he is also just because Judas' sins were not covered by Christ's blood. And so he paid for his error. All right, so that's the sedition. Let me look briefly at the supper. We're almost a little over time, so I want to breeze through this. Let me read to you verses 22 through 25, the rest of our passage this morning. If you ever are at a communion service, this sounds very familiar. And while they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my body of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I shall never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. I want to talk a little bit about the Lord's Supper because it is one of the things, probably the most visible thing that unites, I would say, 99% of Christian churches in the world. If, if you profess to be a Christian church, at some point in your worship, you're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now, some do it weekly, some monthly, some quarterly, some annually. But at some point, if you claim to be a Christian, you celebrate the Lord's Supper. So that seems to be one of the most common uniting things that we all have, and yet it is the Lord's Supper which is the most divisive topic in church history. In, Bible, in uh, Sunday school this morning, we started a new series called Reformation Truths. I'm going to plug that this morning because it's going to impact the rest of our conversation for this sermon, but also hopefully for the future. The Reformation hinged around the words that people said. And so our first lesson this morning was, do words matter? And the answer is absolutely, they matter. In the institution of the Lord's Supper, we see here that he says, uh, take it, taking the bread, Verse 22, he says, this is my body. The question that we asked this morning in Sunday school was, do words matter? Well, if we look at this phrase here in the English, this is my body. One of the, the hinging, most divisive topics around the Lord's Supper in the Reformation was that little tiny word is. This is my body. 
The Roman Catholic Church, when they look at this phrase and they say, this is my body, they say, Jesus said, this is my body. And so the Roman Catholic Church uh, maintains the doctrine called transubstantiation. And so when the priest stands before the altar and, 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 uh, and says the, the words that he says in that moment, when you partake of the Lord's uh, supper, the bread and the wine, you are consuming the real body and blood of Christ. Because Jesus said, this is my body. He said, is, it is it. And that's the Roman Catholic Church maintains. That is the actual body and blood of Christ. Martin Luther wrestling with this because he knew the importance of is. He knew that Jesus clearly said it. Luther is standing, you know, he, he's in this debate uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the folks, the, the Catholics and, and the bishops and cardinals. And uh, there's a famous story where he writes, he's just listening to things and he's writing, carving into, this, into the table, uh, hoc est corpus meum, the Latin of this phrase, this is my body. Because Luther knew that something special was going on in the institution of the Lord's Supper. And so Lutherans, in Luther's, uh, following Luther, believe in consubstantiation. Now, he says that the bread and the wine are, are really present. So when you eat the bread and taste the wine, you're, you're eating bread and you're eating wine. You, you know it. You know what it tastes like. It's not, it's not suddenly body and blood. But he does say that it is somehow communicated, that the body and blood are somehow communicated to the host. And the cup. So Luther held that position. The Anabaptists, uh, namely Zwingli, they went on the far other end. They held what's known as the memorial list. So in, the, in this pa passage here, when Jesus says, this is my body, well, they know of other passages. In John, for instance, where Jesus says, I am the vine. I am the door. I'm the gate. I am this. I am that. Is Jesus physically a gate? Is, is he physically a wine? Is he physically a, 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 a grapevine? Well, we know he's not. And so the Anabaptists and the Zwinglians say like, well, clearly what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, this is like my body. And so they say it's a, a, a memorial, if you will, that it represents Jesus' body and his blood, that it's simply bread and simply wine. So where do we fall? Presbyterians, Reformed Christian Calvinists. Well, we believe that Christ is not physically present in the sacrament, but he is spiritually present. Calvin used the phrase, it's a mystical union. We don't like that word mystical because of what it means to us, but in Calvin's day, mystical just simply means spiritual. It's a, a mystical union that we can't really see and understand. Because somehow God doesn't communicate, or Jesus doesn't communicate his human nature. That's, that was Calvin's point. We know where Jesus is. He's in heaven, right? Bodily, Jesus is in heaven. Have any of us seen Jesus' body on this earth? Absolutely not, because his body is in heaven. And Calvin says that that human body cannot communicate itself to a, a piece of bread. Because it's there. Otherwise, Jesus will be split into thousands, millions of tiny pieces if it's really, truly the body of Christ. But Calvin didn't want to go away and say, well, nothing's really going on. Because Jesus says this is something special. And so Calvin says, this is where we stand, that it's not a physical communication, but it's spiritual. It's mystical. That the divine nature of Christ is present in the host. And we know that Jesus' divine nature can be anywhere. Because his divine nature is what? Omnipresent. Jesus in his divine nature can be and is present in the Lord's Supper. So what does this all mean? Well, let me conclude with this. When we come to the Lord's table, 
we recognize that it is Jesus' divine nature, his divine, his divinity, that is drawing us to him. That it is his divine nature that calls us and draws us to him. And when we partake in the Lord's Supper, we are getting a taste of heaven. What does the psalmist say? See and taste that the Lord is good. The Lord of heaven, the divine nature, we get a glimpse, a taste of heaven. The Lord's table then is a sign and seal of God's covenant promises. All of this round comes back to the covenant and covenant theology. In communion, we see Christ's substitution because that is necessary when we recognize that it is his body sacrificed for us, he is substituted for us. In communion, we see redemption, that we are redeemed by his work, by his blood in which we share. And in communion, we see our daily sustenance. When Jesus tells us, and we prayed earlier, give us this day our daily bread, it's not just talking about our physical food, but our spiritual sustenance. And it's the Lord's table that helps us. Which is why we must heed Paul's warning when we come to the Lord's table. To eat and drink after discerning our own faithfulness. Because it goes back to what's going on in this scene. Did Judas discern his own faithfulness? No. He lied to Jesus. He said, oh, I'm not one of them. I won't betray you. And yet we know he did. He did not examine his own faithfulness. And therefore he received the just condemnation. So when we eat and drink, when we come before the, the, the holy table, when we come before God's holy throne and worship, if we do not discern in ourselves our own faithfulness. Then we eat and drink condemnation, much like Judas. And here's the thing. Remember what Paul says. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so my simple question to you, church, is this. Are you covered by the blood of Christ? Are you in Christ Jesus? If the answer is yes, guess what? There is no condemnation. Go and serve the Lord. But if the answer is no, then there is condemnation. And the only way to be covered from that is to be covered by the blood of Christ. So I want you to join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit be in our lives that we may come to discern for ourselves the gospel focus. Lord, the, the, the gospel is clear. There is a clarity to it that we can understand how redemption comes. And it is through the work and person of Jesus Christ. Lord, it takes the Holy Spirit to open up our eyes so that we can see that light. Otherwise, we will live in the darkness. Lord, I, I pray for the, the discernment to, to see Christ and understanding who Christ is. Who Christ tells us he is. Not the Christ we want him to be, but the Christ he is. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit help us to discern what is pleasing in your eyes. Lord, there are things that you find abominable. And there are things that you find pleasing. Help us to discern between them. Lord, I pray for a devotion to Jesus, your Son, our Savior, that, that we may not be ashamed of who he is and who we are in him. And we do not need to be ashamed of his gospel truth. And that we do not need to fear him. If we are covered by his blood, when we stand before that awful throne, we don't need to tremble in fear of condemnation. 
because we know that there is no condemnation for those in Christ. And Lord, I pray that we in this life refrain from turning from him. As Judas turned, so too many have turned in church history and even in our own lives. Lord, I pray that we can remain faithful just as you are faithful. And so to that end, I pray for protection and perseverance in your saints. Lord, these are dark and troubling times for your church. We look around and we see sinfulness running rampant even within our own walls. We see sinfulness accepted, propagated, and supported in our communities, in our world. And so, Lord, I pray that you give us your strength in these dark and troubling times. Make us aware and focused on, on the hopeful, glorious future that you have promised to us. Lord, if you were faithful in your promises in history past, Lord, we know you are faithful in history to come. And so, Lord, I pray for the courage to live out our calling in this life. May we turn and follow you. Amen.